Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on the new early intervention rule for transition. This is Lori Myers, and I'm the early intervention program training coordinator. Our subject matter expert today is going to be Karen Kincaid. Um, she is one of the early intervention program consultants, and she has been working on a lot of projects related to transition. We also have Diane Fox, who's the early intervention program manager, and Nathan Dedino will be on the call as well. He is the Part C coordinator. So our goal for today is to uh, briefly review the changes to the rule and then respond to questions submitted by the field. We, um, in some of the past webinars, We've kind of veered off from some of the questions submitted ahead of time and tried to answer other questions on the spot, and that wasn't working as well as we wanted to. So we're really going to try to stick to um, just the questions that were submitted in advance, and then for new questions, we will answer those later in an FAQ. Um, the same thing will go for questions not directly related to transition. If you have something that pops into your mind that you want to ask about, feel free to submit those questions, but we'll be answering those um, also in the FAQs. If you do have any clarifying questions, so if we give an answer and you're not sure what we meant or you need clarification, um, we will try to answer those today, so feel free to submit those as well. Just to remind everyone why we're doing these webinars, um, we are doing these webinars to prepare to implement our new rules July 1st, 2019. Our targeted audience is service early intervention service coordinators, early intervention supervisors, and um, FCFC. We have a lot of full teams we know that participate, but the um, the, the target or the purpose is to um, assist local administrators uh, with um, perhaps changing some policies, changing some processes locally in order to be ready to implement July 1st. Um, part of the webinar, um, what we're trying to do too is emphasize what hasn't changed so much um, in the upcoming rule and what has changed in the upcoming rule. So we're trying to highlight what we think is very um, important and might lead to some process and or procedural changes locally. All of the facilitated webinars are, are we're being recorded right now. So they will be available um, online on our um, website. And Lori, can you take us there where these resources are? Yes, I sure will. That way you can see exactly. So you would go to Ohio Early Intervention. And as Lori has it on her favorite, hopefully it's one of your favorite tabs as well. So OhioEarlyIntervention.org. Things are running a little slow today. They are. I think it's maybe the long weekend. Mm -hmm. So all of these webinars are being recorded and will be posted on our website. And we're going to show you here in a little bit. So it's under the Provider tab. I don't see it yet, Lori. It's still doing the little circling thing. Oh. So it hasn't, yeah, pulled up mm -hmm. the website yet. Hmm. So you have to talk and fill the time and tell jokes. OK, OK. Mm -hmm. So tell okay. jokes, uh-oh. <laughs> um, so it's posted on our website under the Providers tab under Early Intervention 2019. You'll find the rules there. You'll find um, the um, information on my learning and how to access, uh, which will take you to the information, how to access our rule recordings. We strongly, 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 strongly advise that you participate in these rule recordings and read the rules prior to submitting your questions. Um, and uh, it will be very, very important to um, participate in the uh, forms uh, rule recording. Um, not a whole lot will make sense to you, I think, if, uh, if you don't participate in the rule recording because all of our forms um, will be new. There, all right, there's our so website. There it is. So here's the tab that Di was talking about, the providers tab, it's yellow in the center of the screen. And then you would scroll down to the bottom where it says Early Intervention Rules 2019. And then we have this page here that kind of um, 
summarizes all of the different rule resources. So in addition to the recordings of the webinars, we also have some courses that you can take for credit. Um, and those are broken down into the different areas of the rule, the different rules that have changed. And those are all posted on my learning. So there's a link here to take you to my learning. And then there's a link if you need instructions for creating an account or for accessing the courses. And then this is where, as Di mentioned, the um, recordings are posted. And so we have three of them posted so far, along with the PowerPoint slides. And then down below that, we have a training schedule for the rest of the webinars. And then we have a training schedule for the in-person regional trainings that are coming up in August through October. And those will be face-to-face -face in each region. And they will be different than the webinars in that they will be um, very practical, scenario-based to really give you guidance on, you know, now that you've been implementing the rules for a couple months, where are you finding challenges and um, how can we help? And then at the very bottom is where we're posting the FAQs. Um, those are taking a little bit longer to get ready because they go through several levels of review and sometimes our legal department is weighing in on some of the issues. So we'll be posting some of those um, this week so you can keep checking back and we'll have more of those documents posted there. Thank you, Lori, for that nice overview. All right. Okay. So we, uh, we want to encourage you to take advantage of the uh, resources that we have made available to you. We've worked very hard to, to make sure that these are useful and will help you with implementing new rule come July 1st, 2019. Next. So again, just a reminder, registration is coming soon, uh, but we wanted to give you the date so that you could kind of save the date. Uh, for our uh, regional trainings. It, this will not be um, a lecture uh, type of um, experience. Rather, it will be scenario based, as Lori described, really digging into um, the activity that needs facilitated and coordinated and how to do that. So we're looking forward to that and, and meeting all of you face to face. Next. So now I would like to turn over the presentation to our content expert, Karen Kincaid. Karen, take it away. Good morning. Um, so let's start off by just talking about when transition starts. This is new um, with new rule. Um, it used to be 18 months, but it is important to remember that the official conversation regarding transition starts at the IFSP meeting closest to the child's second birthday. This includes explaining what transition is and how to involve their local education agency in the process. For children determined eligible after their second birthday, this happens as soon as possible after eligibility is determined and may occur at the initial IFSP meeting. Next. The first part of transition rule explains the requirements for disclosure of personally identifiable information related to transition. There are two new forms, EI07, consents for transition, and EI08, consent to refer child to the LEA and the SEA. The consent for transition has been pulled out of from the IFSP is now a separate document. In both sections, consent for transition and transition planning conference, we have added boxes for parents to consent or not give consent. Parents will check the appropriate box and then sign and date. The EI07 is used to obtain consent to share the child's name and date of birth and the parent's contact information with the LEA and ODE. EI07 is also used to obtain consent to scheduling a TPC. If the parent does not consent to scheduling a TPC, the team should still support the family in transitioning out of EI. 
when a referral is re received 45 or fewer days before the child's third birthday, central intake often makes the referral to the LEA and ODE. However, Karen, when, sorry for the interruption. We're getting uh, several comments that the sound is cutting in and out um, of all of the presenters. So if, um, so I'm going to close any open icons that I have on my desktop. Sometimes that helps and then uh, also check our microphones. So just uh, bear with us for just a couple, hopefully just a few seconds while we make sure we have all the unused icons, anything running. And if you would do the same, if you have any, um, um, anything that you're not using on your desktop or anything running in the background, it kind of helps um, for some reason, even with the audio, uh, to uh, turn those off. Okay, Kristen, and some people are reporting that the sound is fine. Okay, there was just enough uh, that we thought we better make sure. Okay, I think we're good to go, Karen. Sorry for the interruption. Okay, that's okay. When a referral is received 45 or fewer days before the child's third birthday, central intake often makes the referral to the LEA and ODE. However, when the service coordination agency receives these referrals, the early intervention service coordinator must use EIO8 to obtain consent to share the personally identifiable information with the LEA and ODE. Next. Now it's time for a couple of knowledge checks. Di, take it away. Sure. Okay, so our first poll, let's see if we can, I will. So Lori, did you open the poll? Um, no, not yet, but I can go ahead and do that. Okay, that'd be great. All right, so our first poll, when does the official conversation about transition start? Select one, A, at the first visit with the family, B, after the initial IFSP is signed, or C, at the IFSP meeting closest to the child's second birthday. Go ahead and submit your answers, or answer, just one. Oh, okay. 61% have voted. Sixty-eight. Anything over seventy, I share the answer, so keep them coming. Okay. So Karen, right now we have the winner as C. Eighty-five percent at the IFSP meeting closest to the child's second birthday. And that answer is correct. That is. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's do another one. So. We'll open the next one, and it's true or false. True or false, the consent for transition is a form separate from the IFSP. And I'm going to say this one again. Might, this might be tricky. True or false, the consent for transition is a form separate from the IFSP. So we're talking about the IFSP form. And we're talking about new rule, effective July 1st, 2019. Those are just some hints for you. True or false? Okay, 66% have, have voted, Karen. Yes. 69. And... All right. Guess what the answer is? True. Is that right? That is correct. It's on EI Form 07. Good job. Okay. Karen? Yes. Karen, can we go back to the previous question for just a second? 
um, mm -hmm. because I just wanted to clarify, you do start talking about transition from the very beginning, but the official conversation is not until later. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. um, they are required to start that conversation at the IFSP meeting closest to the child's second birthday, but oftentimes that conversation has started with the family before that. Okay, thank you. Okay. So for children who may be eligible for preschool services under Part B with parental consent, the service coordination agency notifies the local education agency at least 90 days prior to the child's third birthday. The Part C service coordination agency must provide a local education agencies with four notifications per year in February, May, August and November. The LEA report is a list of Part C eligible children who may potentially transition to their school district in the next year. This process hasn't changed. Okay. So this is something next. that we're highlighting that has not changed. Okay. If a child is determined eligible for early intervention services in accordance with paragraph C of this rule, more than 45 calendar days and fewer than 90 calendar days before the child's third birthday, and the child may be eligible for preschool services under Part B, as soon as possible after determining the child's eligibility, the early intervention service coordinator shall ensure the parent's consent is obtained using form EI-07 and notify the LEA that the child will reach the age of eligibility for Part B on the child's third birthday. Okay, Karen, let's just kind of, you know, there's a lot of numbers in this one, right? So yes, the child is referred more than 45 days, but less than 90 days. So just think about that, more than 45, less than 90 days before their third birthday. Okay, so we would conduct eligibility. Yep. And we would seek consent from the parent to um, invite the LEA to begin transition because the child is going to be transitioning very, very soon. And so that meeting could occur on during that initial IFSP or potentially after if depending on timelines and availability. Okay, thank you. Next. This one has a lot of numbers in it too. If a child is referred to early intervention 45 or fewer days, calendar days, before the child's third birthday, there is no requirement to conduct an evaluation, assessment, or IFSP meeting for the child. If the child may be eligible for preschool services under Part B, either central intake or the early intervention service coordinator shall obtain consent using EI Form 08 for a referral to the local education agency and notification to ODE. Note that it is expected that when referrals come into the EI system 45 or fewer calendar days before the child's third birthday, that central intake will be taking will be talking to the parents about consent to refer or whether the parent prefers to self-refer to the LEA. However, because there may be times when the early intervention service coordinator gets the call about services at age three, the early intervention service coordinator must also be aware of this federal and state requirements for referrals. Actually, that timeline wasn't too bad, right? <laughs> it's like no, not a child referred 45 or fewer calendar days, so really, really soon the child will be turning three. And I believe this is no change from our current practice. You are correct. I think it's time for another poll. I think so too. All right. 
true or false. And again, this is for our current, or no, our new rule, July effective July 1st, 2019. True, ah, okay, <laughs> okay. True or false, for children who may be eligible for Part B services, the Early Intervention Service Coordinator must obtain parent consent to notify the LEA. True or false, for children who may be eligible for Part B services, the Early Intervention Service Coordinator must obtain parent consent to notify the LEA. Wow, we're already at 62% and there's one clear winner, Karen. Yes. And the I would say there is hand. only one option here. We don't share any information with anyone outside of the EI system without parental consent, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This is true. Let's do another one. Okay. Ooh, this one, we might have to give you a few more seconds, right? What are the requirements for transition when a child is suspected eligible for Part B services? What are the requirements for transition when a child is suspected eligible for Part B services? Obtain consent to share information with the LEA. Obtain consent to invite the LEA to the TPC. Develop IFSP outcome with steps, activities to meet the outcome, and in this situation, a transition, an outcome that supports transition. Conduct TPC between nine months and 90 calendar days of the third birthday. We only have like 36%, so people are thinking about this one. It's okay if you need to take some time. So what are the requirements for transition when a child is suspected eligible for Part B services? Obtain consent to share information with the LEA. Obtain consent to invite the LEA to the TPC. Develop IFSP outcome with steps, activities to meet the outcome in this situation, a transition, an outcome to support transition. Conduct TPC between nine months and 90 calendar days of the third birthday. You can check all that apply. We're now at 70%. So we have 97% that say um, we must obtain consent to share information with the LEA. We have 94% that say we must obtain consent to invite the LEA to the TPC. We have 86% that says that um, we need to develop an IFSP outcome with the steps and activities needed to address um, an outcome that supports transition. And 81% say that we conduct a TPC between nine months and 90 days, 90 calendar days of the child's third birthday if the parent has consented to the TPC. So, so about 81% of us believe it's all four. So what's the right answer, Karen? It is all of them. That is correct. Yeah. Good job. Those are all in, those are all important pieces of helping a family transition out into um, out of EI. And in this situation, possibly Part B services so that there's a smooth and services are not interrupted for the child. Correct. All right. Good. Next. Next. 
So 5123-1002L2 of this rule describes the requirements for the IFSP transition planning. First, you will see the requirements for the transition outcome in the IFSP. Transition outcomes are required for all children approaching their third birthday. While the intent has not changed, the wording has been changed from for children who are at least two years and three months old to not fewer than 90 calendar days, but not more than nine months before the child's third birthday. So let's, let me say that one more time because that was a lot. While the intent has not changed, the wording has been changed from for children who are at least two years and three months old to not fewer than 90 calendar days, but not more than nine months before the child's third birthday. The IFSP shall include at least one transition outcome. The transition outcome must include steps that will be taken and the services that will be provided, including needed discussions with and training of the parent regarding future placements and or matters related to their child's transition. Procedures to prepare the child for changes in service delivery, including steps to help the child adjust to and function in a new setting. The identification of steps of transition services, steps and or activities that the IFSP team determines are necessary to support the transition of the child in confirmation with that with parent consent, child find information has been transmitted to the LEA. Next. The transition planning conference must occur as part of an IFSP meeting if the parent provides consent. This is new. Note that all the rule requirements for the IFSP paragraphs mentioned here must be followed. The transition planning conference shall occur not fewer than 90 calendar days and not more than nine months prior to the child's third birthday. If the parent does not provide consent, there is no TPC, but requirements still apply for the transition outcome. There must be a transition outcome and the team must still support the family and transitioning out of EI. Let's give people, Next. this is a big change right here. So how we've been practicing. So just kind of take that in. So transition planning conference must take place as part of an IFSP meeting if the parent consents, um, provides consent. TPC conference timeline as far as shall not occur, occur fewer than 90 days, that's no change, and no more than nine months prior to the child's birthday. And if the child, if the parent does not provide consent, there is no P TPC, but requirements still apply for the transition outcome. So let's. Okay, hopefully I repeated it. So do we need to repeat that again? Cheryl or Tiffany? Yes, please, okay. So the transition planning conference must occur as part of an IFSP meeting if the parent consents to the TPC. So that's, that's one parent must consent, and if they do, the TPC must be conducted um, as part of an IFSP meeting. 
all the rule requirements for the IFSP that we just talked about a couple weeks ago um, are applicable. So during the transition meeting, as far as who you invite, et cetera, et cetera. The transition planning conference shall occur not fewer than 90 calendar days, but no more than nine months. So that's no change. Here's another change. If the parent does not provide consent, there is no TPC, but the requirements still apply for the transition outcome. So there must be a transition outcome and the team must still support the family in transitioning out of early intervention. Robin, you've got it. <laughs> got it, good, okay. I think we can move forward. Awesome. Oh, it's poll time, all right. So Lori, open the poll, please. So there's two, so true or false. And again, this is for um, the rule that will be implemented July 1st, 2019. So make sure you understand that. True or false, all children must have a TPC, Transition Planning Conference. All children must have a TPC. True or false? Dang, I thought we might trick them on this one, Karen, but I don't think we are. 62% <laughs> have already... 66% have already voted and there's a clear, uh, <laughs> clear winner here. Yes. Yeah. So 83%, mm -hmm, 83% have said false, Karen. That is correct. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's if the parents consent. So a parent may choose not to have a TPC meeting, and we still have to help them with transition out of the program without having a TPC. And we'll do that through the IFSP outcome that supports transition. Yes. All right. Next one. Oh, okay. So this is true or false, and again, July 1st, 2019 are new rules. All children must have a transition outcome. True or false? All children must have a transition outcome. True or false? If you cannot um, participate um, via the computer, you can type in your answer. I forgot to say that. Oh, 66%, 69% have voted already. So that's less than 29 seconds, by the way. It's able to time how long it takes to do the um, come up with the answer. So 97% say true, Karen. That is correct. In IFSP, all children must have a transition outcome written um, no earlier than nine months before their third birthday or no later than 30 days. 90 days before their third birthday. So 90 days prior to their third birthday, no earlier than nine months. Okay, so we have quite a few questions, Karen, about uh, this uh, portion of the rule, and it will probably take up the rest of our time. So thank you, everyone who submitted the questions um, to us ahead of time to give us the opportunity to, to look uh, through rule and, and make sure we have our a clear answer for you. So there's about well, probably six or so. So mm -hmm. um, so we will share with you uh, the questions and um, the answers. So next. I know, so yes, 
I think uh, maybe Lori, are you still on? Yes. Oh, good. I think your uh, screen is frozen. Oh, it's on my side. It's showing the first question. Is it no, not, not on ours? No. no. Okay. Mm -mm. Let me see. Let me go back and try it again. How about now? No. 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 Okay, can I give the screen over to somebody else? See if sure. that works. Okay. Give it to Karen. I think she's got hers up because I closed <laughs> mine out. <laughs> okay, well, I'm not sure it's only showing Diane. Oh, let, I think this one's Karen. Let me try this. Mm hmm. No. Well, I think we can still go through the questions and the answers without the visual. And okay, can I maybe try giving the screen to you, Di, and see if that works? Sure, sure, okay. I've got to. Let me try that just to pull up my PowerPoint here. Yeah. Sorry for the technical difficulties. It's always something. That's okay. Actually, I'm going to try giving myself back the screen because I think. I was going to say mine. Uh... <laughs> Let me try this. Okay, I've got it up now. I can... Okay, are you seeing mine again? I, or not I yet? see the questions. Yay. Nope. Okay, all right. I think we fixed okay, now it. Now i got to get. Okay, let me get out of here. Sorry about that. Okay, so the first question, and the bottom of the screen is the actual rule that we're talking about, the particular section. So we're talking about J four through nine. J. J four through nine. Okay. So there's lots of questions in this one. Okay. Um, so what if the TPC occurs without another agency? We have always been advised a TPC must occur even if the family chooses not to meet with the LEA or another agency. So remember, that's the big change, right, in the, in the new rules. For example, if a family believes their child will be ineligible or does not want to meet with the LEA and wants their child to simply be at home with them or pay for therapy with insurance, I've always held a TPC to discuss ongoing options and how to contact the LEA or other agencies to help in the future. Is this no longer called a TPC? I assume the conversation should still happen. Great question, and I love the way it's worded. Karen? So, Laura, if you want to go to the next slide. There are several scenarios that can occur, and the answer depends on which scenario applies. So, the first one is the child is suspected of being eligible for Part B. The parent consents to the TPC and consents to invite the LEA to the TPC. In this case, the TPC occurs during the IFSP meeting and the LEA is invited. The next scenario is the child is not suspected of being eligible for a Part B and the parent consents to a TPC. So the TPC occurs during an IFSP meeting and other community providers are invited. Head Start, preschools, wherever the chair, whoever the parent wants to invite to that meeting. The third scenario is the parent does not consent to the TPC. The team will develop a transition outcome 
but not hold a TPC meeting. And they'll address the transition from early intervention through that transition outcome. As in the past, if a parent has consented to the TPC, it needs to occur during the required time frame. If the LEA or other provider is unable to attend, the, the Early Intervention Service Coordinator still needs to hold the TPC. If the parent chooses to wait, the example being the LEA is not available to meet and the parent wants to wait until they are available, the Early Intervention Service Coordinator must document the parent's request in case notes to support the non-compliant reason for the late TPC. Very good. Karen, Karen, I yes. just wanted to add something. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning, but there is a handout in your handout section of these PowerPoint slides. So if that is helpful and you would like to have those, you can pull those up in the handout part of your dashboard and you can download those or print those if you're near a printer. And we have a clarifying question. Um, when does the transition outcome need to be developed? The transition outcome must be developed no later than 90 days before their third birthday and no earlier than nine months prior to their third birthday. And this outcome is developed at a what? At an IFSP meeting. Mm -hmm. So yes. So one thing that helps me, if you look at the rule, um, so um, in section L, if you go to two, it's, it's kind of broken down by these scenarios, so to speak. So like 2A talks about the individualized family service plan and about the transition and the discussions and the identification of the, um, the steps and the um, activities and that you develop the outcome during that IFSP meeting and that IFSP meeting must meet the definition of an IFSP meeting. So, and then B talks about, little b, talks about if the child is eligible or we suspect the child is eligible for Part B services. And then little c talks about um, the children who we do not suspect is eligible for Part B services or the family has not, a parent has not consented um, to invite the LEA or participate in the TPC. So mark these, I know I have in bright pink. Um, so that's L, two, and then little a, little b, little c. It's, it's really written like in order. So this should be very, very helpful to you. So tab it and um, it'll be very helpful to refer to. Oh, I'm s All right. Nathan, are there any other question, clarifying questions related to this slide? Can the transition outcome be developed at the TPC? Yes. As long as um, the transition outcome um, can be um, developed at the TPC meeting or it can be reviewed at the TPC meeting because the, um, now um, the TPC has to occur at an IFSP meeting. So some families need more time for transition. So you may have written that earlier in the process or you may write it at the TPC meeting. Okay. Any other clarifying questions? I think we're good, okay. All right, we'll go ahead and move on. And if we did not get to yours or we, we missed it for some reason, we will make sure um, to uh, put it in our FAQs. I also wanted to um, just share with you our FAQs. Sometimes we get 
um, really the same question, but it's worded different ways. So you may not see your question exactly word for word on the FAQ, but you should be able to see um, the content of your question or the context of your question in the FAQs that we're developing. So uh, for example, we may get um, six questions about does um, the transition out uh, TPC take place in an IFSP. We may get that like six times, but it may be worded differently. So we will try to to uh, summarize it in like a statewide response. So we just wanted to make sure that you you knew that we will do our we will answer all the questions. We just um, it just may not be worded word for word how you have written it. Okay, let's get to uh, there's some more questions. Like I said, this one we have a lot. Um, of questions. So I know um, the transition outcome is completed during a regularly scheduled IFSP review, which makes sense. But can you please clarify whether an IFSP review will now be required at the TPC? For most families, this meeting is heavily focused on meeting with the school district and answering questions about transition. Adding a requirement to review the IFSP takes away from the service coordinator just being present to support the family and answer questions and may lead to poor quality IFSP reviews rushed at the end of the meeting. So the answer to your question is found in rule 5123 dash 10 dash 02 L 2 B. It states that a transition planning conference is conducted during an IFSP meeting in accordance with the paragraphs J4 to J9 and K of this rule. This aligns with the federal requirements for transition. Let me say that again because that was a lot. This answer is in 5123-10-02L2B. It states that a transition planning conference is conducted during an IFSP meeting in accordance with paragraphs J4 to J9 and K of this rule. This aligns with the federal requirements for transition. Let's let that sink in. I, was, I hit um, send too, uh, too soon. There's a question about, can you give us an example of an IFSP outcome? So we, we won't be able to do that um, uh, this morning, but we will um, have an IFSP um, outcome that supports transition um, as a, an example in our um, IFSP form guidance document. So that is coming soon for you too. So we will, uh, we're making sure that uh, one example is a transition. So take that away. And I'm just waiting on Nathan to see if there's any clarifying questions that we can answer. So today we've de de dedicated um, Nathan to uh, reviewing all the questions because last time I think I, I missed a couple questions and we don't want to miss them. So I'm just going to give a few minutes. Let's go on to the second one because these are all related. If the goal of adding an IFSP review to the TPC is that the meeting is completed at a regularly scheduled review, please note that most school districts are not willing to meet much earlier than the 33 month due date as the TPC starts their timelines for completing evaluations, et cetera. Is this something that has been considered? So this new rule, it aligns with federal requirements that the TPC occur at an IFSP meeting. Um, as we said previously, if the LEA cannot be present, the TPC can still occur. And if the parent chooses to wait until the um, LEA can be present at the meeting, then it's up to the Early Intervention Service Coordinator to document that what the parent's wishes were so that it um, shows reason for the um, non-compliance reason for the TPC going over the 90 days before the third birthday. Okay, thank you. 
All right. Just looking for any clarifying questions. We've got a number of kind of specific questions. We, we'll to kind of okay. So Nathan shared that we have a number of specific, so there's like examples and that kind of thing, that um, those are really difficult to answer on a webinar because of the um, specifics and one little detail can change uh, guidance sometimes. So we will answer those um, in our FAQs or maybe even use them as part of our regional if they have enough specifics in them, right, Karen? Okay, yes. please, please clarify the new Transition Steps and Activities tab in EIDS. What type of things should be entered here? Is this completed at the Transition Outcome or the TPC? That tab is the information for the Transition Steps and services indicator that we are required to report on in our APR. It is the steps or activities taken to accomplish the transition outcome. To meet the transition steps and services requirement, it must be an outcome on an IFSP at least nine months, but not more than 90 days prior to the child's third birthday. This is where we should be noting what, who, how is being done to support the child and family to ensure a smooth transition to wherever the child will go or services needed after transition or whatever services are needed to support the transition. I think people are, uh, several of our participants um, sharing with us that there's uh, some bad weather approaching and so uh, the quality of the audio may or may not be optimal. We also understand um, our colleagues in Dayton uh, last night had some severe weather as well so hopefully everyone is safe. Um, we are recording this so hopefully the recording will will turn out um, well and you'll be able to listen again if, if you need to and then uh, you'll also have the FAQs and we will include these questions that we're answering and also any of the additional ones that we need to ask. All right so um, TPCs were previously a requirement for all families. It looks like it is now an option under new rule. Is this correct? According to 5123-10-02L2B, parental consent using form EI07 is required to schedule a TPC meeting. Parents may choose not to have a TPC. So remember, TPCs are not, um, we do not conduct TPCs without parental consent. So if a parent says no, we would not coordinate a TPC. But all children would have an IFSP outcome to support their transition uh, from C to wherever um, the plan is for them to, to go at age three. Okay, next, we have a couple more. Okay, both this form and EIDS now use the language asking if the parent gives consent to a TPC. Our understanding is that every child has a transition planning conference. Aren't service coordinators required to do transition planning for all children even if the family does not want to invite the LEA. When is an example of when a parent can opt out of a transition planning conference? So um, again, please see rule 5123-10-02L2B, which includes the requirements for transition planning conference. The new rules are aligned with the federal requirements that the parent provide consent. The TPC is only conducted 
with parent consent. This is clarified in the training for the rule 02. Mm -hmm. So again, service coordinators, um, one of their roles is to ensure a smooth transition from B to C services if the family consents to the TPC and the LEA being invited. Um, but even for families who do not consent to a TPC, um, there, sh there will be an IFSP outcome that supports transition. And so that's where our service co EI service coordinators will um, be responsible for making sure those steps and activities and or services um, happen. So it, it really, I think um, it's, kind of getting in our heads that no, that requirement, previously, yes, all, all families had to um, participate in a TPC. So that is no longer the case July 1st, 2019. TPCs are conducted only with parent consent. Okay. All right. Any clarifying questions, Nathan? Oh, okay. We do have a couple questions related to this, but Nathan says we need to do some additional research to make sure our um, answer is accurate. So we will uh, address those on FAQ. I think this is our last question. It appears this consent gives permission for the child EI07, so form EI07. So I'm going to turn to my EI07 here. It appears that this consent gives permission for the child's information to go to the LEA. Is there a time frame in which this consent can and must be completed? Yes, um, these, rule, these requirements are addressed in Rule 5123-10-02L1B. So the school district is required to receive this information no later than 90 days prior to their third birthday. And this also um, gives consent for the um, LEA to receive those reports those four times a year, February, May, August, and November. Um, so there's this um, consent's given for the report. And that um, consent, um, that conversation starts at the, um, the IFSP closest to the second birthday. Okay, we do. And we have a clarifying question. Um, it, is this the one about the TPC? So yes, so we were asked to clarify again about um, if the parent does not consent to the TPC, then the service coordinator will not coordinate or facilitate the TPC. The service coordinator would still create a transition outcome and review the outcome and the steps with the parent. However, we would not call that a transition conference. That is correct, Pam. You got it. We would call that an IFSP, <laughs> right? And, and whether it's a, a, a periodic review or the annual, um, so it'd be an IFSP meeting, and during that meeting, you will develop an outcome that supports transition, and that outcome will include steps and activities to support that outcome. Awesome. At what age does the child's name appear on the LEA report? So any child turning three within one year of the run date. So any child turning three within a one year of the run date and only with parent consent. So that's very important 
you know, hear about the LEA notification, that's only done with parent consent. TPC, only done with parent consent. Okay. All right. This section, I mean, probably of all the, um, the sections in our rule, this section has the most changes, largely due to um, our work with ODE, our collaboration around transition from C to B with our partners at ODE. So a better understanding of the transition process and the federal uh, rules around it. So this section probably, um, has more changes than, than the other. So um, please make sure your service coordinators, and if you are an EI service coordinator, that you really um, read and read and use all the resources that we have available to you to support um, you with um, understanding these new requirements. Also, do not hesitate to reach out to your program consultant if um, you want to walk through some scenarios or you need some additional support. We are here for you. So is there any support between DOD and uh, D ODE and DOD around transition? And I'm happy to report, and Lori, you can probably take us to the um, um, so we, we have already shared um, these new requirements with ODE. So I think, Lori, you can take us back to the website. So we um, were, have been working with ODE for the last two years on um, collaborating around transition. And as a result of that collaboration, we have developed a, uh, the state team developed a training packet that will be available to every school district in the state of Ohio. Ocali is the contractor who will um, implement the training on behalf of ODE and in collaboration with Dodd EI as well. And so you will have the opportunity to participate in this training whenever this training is scheduled um, in um, a school district that you're working with. So it was on our rotator, so IDE, C to B training opportunity. So part of this training is to clarify the federal regulations, both with Part C and Part B. There's also a guidance document that we worked really, really hard on that talks about um, the transition from C to B. You will receive that at the training um, also, along with some other resources. It will also focus on your local interagency agreement um, around transition. So this is the information of what you will learn and who should attend. And really in your county, if you uh, desire the training, register today, uh, you, you attend as a team. And so um, your family and children first coordinator or your EI contract manager or a representative from your LEA can can register. So um, so take advantage of that. So they're going to, um, uh, you fill out a, a questionnaire and then uh, you'll be contacted by uh, Ocali for scheduling the training. So yes, we have a whole training packet available to you to support transition from C to B and part B um, at the state level understands um, the, the different requirements and there's a lot of clarifying information for our Part B partners in our local school districts in, in this training too. So we think this will help tremendously. The plan is for all school districts to participate in this training, the C2B, which means um, the service coordinator, coordinating co contract manager, FCFC, um, will be invited to attend these as well. That's exciting. So just to review how we got to that registration page, um, the website is, is kind of being slow right now, but if you see these banners that are on the, the home page, the landing page of the website, you can click the little arrows to go to the different banners 
and then when you get to the one you want, so here's our C to B, you just click on the banner itself, and then it might not be doing it right at this moment, but it will take <laughs> you right to that registration page. Okay. Awesome. All right. I think we have one more poll. All right. How must the team proceed if the LEA cannot attend the TPC? So what happens if the LEA cannot attend the P TPC? Select one. Hold the TPC without the LEA. Wait until the LEA is available to meet. Or do not hold the TPC. Identify the transition outcome, steps, and activities. Oh. So we have answers in all three boxes, but one stands out, and we've got about half of us that have voted. So keep those answers coming. How must the team proceed if the LEA cannot attend the TPC? Hold the TPC without the LEA? Wait until the LEA is available to meet? Or do not hold the TPC? Identify transition outcome state steps and activities. Almost 60%. I think people are taking some time to think about this one. So keep your votes coming. How must the team proceed if the LEA cannot attend the TPC? What do we do if the LEA cannot attend the TPC? Do we hold the TPC without the LEA? Do we wait until the LEA is available to meet? Or do we not hold the TPC? We just develop a transition outcome with the steps and activities. I like that. Okay, so our poll says 75% hold the TPC without the LEA, 18% wait until the LEA is available to meet, 7% do not hold the TPC, identify the transition outcome, steps, and activities. Karen, which one is it? It is actually hold the TPC without the LEA. Um, and the only time that would be different is if the parent chooses to wait for the LEA to be there, in which the service coordinator would document the parent's decision in their notes. Uh oh. Hello, I've lost audio. I hear you. I do also. I couldn't hear you guys for a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> Better now? Yes. Okay. So that's very important that it, the family makes the, the parent makes the decision as Absolutely. far as whether to hold the TPC without the LEA. All right. Lori, can you wrap this up for us? Yeah, Thank you I for submitting all know. these questions. We really appreciate it. And hopefully this was helpful. 